Chapter Eight, Part Two of Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Anna Roberts. Fox's Book of Martyrs, Volume One, by John Fox, edited by William Byron Forbush. Chapter Eight: An Account of the Persecutions in Bohemia under the Papacy, Part Two. Persecution of Ziska. The real name of this zealous servant of Christ was John de Troxnow. That of Ziska is a Bohemian word signifying one-eyed, as he had lost an eye. He was a native of Bohemia, of a good family, and left the court of Wenceslas to enter into the service of the King of Poland against the Teutonic Knights. Having obtained a badge of honor and a purse of ducats for his gallantry, at the close of the war, he returned to the court of Wenceslas, to whom he boldly avowed the deep interest he took in the bloody affront offered to his majesty's subjects at Constance in the affair of Huss. Wenceslas lamented it was not in his power to revenge it, and from this moment Ziska is said to have formed the idea of asserting the religious liberties of his country. In the year 1418 the council was dissolved, having done more mischief than good, and in the summer of that year a general meeting was held of the Friends of Religious Reformation, at the castle of Wisgrade, who, conducted by Ziska, repaired to the emperor with arms in their hands, and offered to defend him against his enemies. The king bid them use their arms properly, and this stroke of policy first ensured to Ziska the confidence of his party. Wenceslas was succeeded by Sigismond, his brother, who rendered himself odious to the reformers, and removed all such as were obnoxious to his government. Ziska and his friends, upon this, immediately flew to arms, declared war against the emperor and the pope, and laid siege to Pilsen with forty thousand men. They soon became masters of the fortress, and in a short time all the southwest part of Bohemia submitted, which greatly increased the army of the reformers. The latter having taken the pass of Moldaw, after a severe conflict of five days and nights, the emperor became alarmed, and withdrew his troops from the confines of Turkey, to march them into Bohemia. At Bern, in Moravia, he halted, and sent dispatches to treat of peace, as a preliminary to which Ziska gave up Pilsen and all the fortresses he had taken. Sigismund proceeded in a manner that clearly manifested he acted on the Roman doctrine, that no faith was to be kept with heretics, and treating some of the authors of the late disturbances with severity, the alarm bell of revolt was sounded from one end of Bohemia to the other. Ziska took the castle of Prague by the power of money, and on August 19, 1420, defeated the small army the emperor had hastily got together to oppose him. He next took Ossia by assault, and destroyed the town with a barbarity that disgraced the cause in which he fought. Winter approaching, Ziska fortified his camp on a strong hill about forty miles from Prague, which he called Mount Tabor, whence he surprised a body of horse at midnight, and made a thousand men prisoners. Shortly after, the emperor obtained possession of the strong fortress of Prague, by the same means Ziska had before done. It was blockaded by the latter, and want began to threaten the emperor, who saw the necessity of a retreat. Determined to make a desperate effort, Sigismund attacked the fortified camp of Ziska on Mount Tabor, and carried it with great slaughter. Many other fortresses also fell, and Ziska withdrew to a craggy hill, which he strongly fortified, and whence he so annoyed the emperor in his approaches against the town of Prague, that he found he must either abandon the siege or defeat his enemy. The Marquis of Misnia was deputed to effect this with a large body of troops, but the event was fatal to the imperialists. They were defeated, and the emperor, having lost nearly one-third of his army, retreated from the siege of Prague, harassed in his rear by the enemy. In the spring of 1421, Ziska commenced the campaign, as before, by destroying all the monasteries in his way. He laid siege to the castle of Wisgrade, and the emperor, coming to relieve it, fell into a snare and was defeated with dreadful slaughter, and this important fortress was taken. Our general had now leisure to attend to the work of the Reformation, but he was much disgusted with the gross ignorance and superstition of the Bohemian clergy, who rendered themselves contemptible in the eyes of the whole army. When he saw any symptoms of uneasiness in the camp, he would spread alarm in order to divert them, and draw his men into action. In one of these expeditions he encamped before the town of Ruby, and while pointing out the place for an assault, an arrow shot from the wall and struck him in the eye. At Prague it was extracted, but, being barbed, it tore the eye out with it. A fever succeeded, and his life was with difficulty preserved. He was now totally blind, but still desirous of attending the army. The emperor, having summoned the states of the empire to assist him, 
resolved, with their assistance, to attack Ziska in the winter, when many of his troops departed until the return of spring. The Confederate princes undertook the siege of Soisin, but at the approach merely of the Bohemian general they retreated. Sigismond nevertheless advanced with his formidable army, consisting of fifteen thousand Hungarian horse and twenty-five thousand infantry, well equipped for a winter campaign. This army spread terror through all the east of Bohemia. Wherever Sigismund marched, the magistrates laid their keys at his feet, and were treated with severity or favor, according to their merits in his cause. Ziska, however, with speedy marches, approached, and the emperor resolved to try his fortune once more with that invincible chief. On the 13th of January, 1422, the two armies met on a spacious plain near Kremnitz. Ziska appeared in the center of his front line, guarded, or rather conducted, by a horseman on each side, armed with a pole-axe. His troops, having sung a hymn, with a determined coolness, drew their swords, and waited for a signal. When his officers had informed him that the ranks were all well closed, he waved his sabre round his head, which was the sign of battle. This battle is described as a most awful sight. The extent of the plain was one continued scene of disorder. The imperial army fled towards the confines of Morovia, the Taborites, without intermission, galling their rear. The river Igla, then frozen, opposed their flight. The enemy pressing furiously, many of the infantry, and in a manner, the whole body of the cavalry, attempted the river. The ice gave way, and not fewer than two thousand were swallowed up in the water. Ziska now returned to Tabor, laden with all the spoils and trophies which the most complete victory could give. Ziska now began to pay attention to the Reformation. He forbid all the prayers for the dead, images, sacerdotal vestments, fasts, and festivals. Priests were to be preferred according to their merits, and no one to be persecuted for religious opinions. In everything Ziska consulted the liberal-minded, and did nothing without general concurrence. An alarming disagreement now arose at Prague between the magistrates, who were Calixtans, or receivers of the sacraments in both kinds, and the Taborites, nine of the chiefs of whom were privately arraigned and put to death. The populace, enraged, sacrificed the magistrates, and the affair terminated without any particular consequence. The Calixtans having sunk into contempt, Ziska was solicited to assume the crown of Bohemia, but this he nobly refused, and prepared for the next campaign, in which Sigismund resolved to make his effort last. While the Marquis of Misnia penetrated into Upper Saxony, the Emperor proposed to enter Moravia, on the side of Hungary. Before the Marquis had taken the field, Ziska sat down before the strong town of Osig, situated on the Elbe. The Marquis flew to its relief with a superior army, and, after an obstinate engagement, was totally defeated, and Osig capitulated. Ziska then went to the assistance of Prokop, a young general whom he had appointed to keep Sigismund in check, and whom he compelled to abandon the siege of Pernitz, after laying eight weeks before it. Ziska, willing to give his troops some respite from fatigue, now entered Prague, hoping his presence would quell any uneasiness that might remain after the late disturbance, but he was suddenly attacked by the people, and he and his troop, having beaten off the citizens, effected a retreat to his army, whom he acquainted with the treacherous conduct of the Calixtans. Every effort of address was necessary to appease their vengeful animosity, and at night, in a private interview between Rokesan, an ecclesiastic of great eminence in Prague, and Ziska, the latter became reconciled, and the intended hostilities were done away. Mutually tired of the war, Sigismund sent to Ziska, requesting him to sheathe his sword, and name his conditions. A place of Congress being appointed, Ziska, with his chief officers, set out to meet the Emperor. Compelled to pass through a part of the country where the plague raged, he was seized with it at the castle of Briscaw, and departed this life, October 6, 1424. Like Moses, he died in view of the completion of his labors, and was buried in the great church of Zalso, in Bohemia, where a monument is erected to his memory, with this inscription on it. Here lies John Ziska, who, having defended his country against the encroachments of papal tyranny, rests in this hallowed place, in despite of the Pope. After the death of Ziska, Prokop was defeated, and fell with the liberties of his country. After the death of Huss and Jerome, the Pope, in conjunction with the Council of Constance, ordered the Roman clergy everywhere to excommunicate such as adopted their opinions, or commiserated their fate. These orders occasioned great contentions between the Papists and Reformed Bohemians, which was the cause of a violent persecution against the latter. 
At Prague the persecution was extremely severe, until, at length, the reformed being driven to desperation, armed themselves, attacked the Senate House, and threw twelve senators, with the Speaker, out of the Senate House windows, whose bodies fell upon spears which were held up by others of the reformed in the street, to receive them. Being informed of these proceedings, the Pope came to Florence, and publicly excommunicated the reformed Bohemians, exciting the Emperor of Germany, and all kings, princes, dukes, etc., to take up arms, in order to extirpate the whole race, and promising, by way of encouragement, full remission of all sins whatever, to the most wicked person, if he did but kill one Bohemian Protestant. This occasioned a bloody war, for several Popish princes undertook the extirpation, or at least expulsion, of the proscribed people, and the Bohemians, arming themselves, prepared to repel force by force, in the most vigorous and effectual manner. The Popish army prevailing against the Protestant forces at the Battle of Cuttenburg, the prisoners of the Reformed were taken to three deep mines near that town, and several hundreds were cruelly thrown into each, where they miserably perished. A merchant of Prague, going to Breslau, in Silesia, happened to lodge in the same inn with several priests. Entering into conversation upon the subject of religious controversy, he passed many encomiums upon the martyr John Huss and his doctrines. The priests, taking umbrage at this, laid an information against him the next morning, and he was committed to prison as a heretic. Many endeavors were used to persuade him to embrace the Roman Catholic faith, but he remained steadfast to the pure doctrines of the Reformed Church. Soon after his imprisonment, a student of the university was committed to the same jail, when, being permitted to converse with the merchant, they mutually comforted each other. On the day appointed for execution, when the jailer began to fasten ropes to their feet, by which they were to be dragged through the streets, the student appeared quite terrified, and offered to abjure his faith, and turn Roman Catholic if he might be saved. The offer was accepted, his abjuration was taken by a priest, and he was set at liberty. A priest applying to the merchant, to follow the example of the student, he nobly said, "'Lose no time in hopes of my recantation. Your expectations will be vain. I sincerely pity that poor wretch, who has miserably sacrificed his soul for a few more uncertain years of a troublesome life, and, so far from having the least idea of following his example, I glory in the very thoughts of dying for the sake of Christ.' On hearing these words, the priest ordered the executioner to proceed, and the merchant, being drawn through the city, was brought to the place of execution, and there burnt. Pischel, a bigoted Popish magistrate, apprehended twenty-four Protestants, among whom was his daughter's husband. As they all owned they were of the Reformed religion, he indiscriminately condemned them to be drowned in the river Abyss. On the day appointed for the execution, a great concourse of people attended, among whom was Pischel's daughter. This worthy wife threw herself at her father's feet, bedewed them with tears, and in the most pathetic manner implored him to commiserate her sorrow and pardon her husband. The obdurate magistrate sternly replied, "'Intercede not for him, child. He is a heretic, a vile heretic.' To which she nobly answered, "'Whatever his faults may be, or however his opinions may differ from yours, he is still my husband, a name which, at a time like this, should alone employ my whole consideration.' Pischel flew into a violent passion, and said, "'You are mad. Cannot you, after the death of this, have a much worthier husband?' "'No, sir,' replied she, "'my affections are fixed upon this, and death itself shall not dissolve my marriage vow.' Pischel, however, continued inflexible, and ordered the prisoners to be tied with their hands and feet behind them, and in that manner be thrown into the river. As soon as this was put into execution, the young lady watched her opportunity, leaped into the waves, and, embracing the body of her husband, both sank together into one watery grave. An uncommon instance of conjugal love in a wife, and of an inviolable attachment to, and personal affection for, her husband. The Emperor Ferdinand, whose hatred to the Bohemian Protestants was without bounds, not thinking he had sufficiently oppressed them, instituted a high court of reformers, upon the plan of the Inquisition, with this difference, that the reformers were to remove from place to place, and always to be attended by a body of troops." These reformers consisted chiefly of Jesuits, and from their decision there was no appeal, by which it may be easily conjectured that it was a dreadful tribunal indeed. This bloody court, attended by a body of troops, made the tour of Bohemia, in which they seldom examined or saw a prisoner, suffering the soldiers to murder the Protestants as they pleased, and then to make a report of the matter to them afterward. The first victim of their cruelty was an aged minister, whom they killed as he lay sick in his bed, the next day they robbed and murdered another, 
and soon after shot a third, as he was preaching in his pulpit. A noble and clergyman, who resided in a Protestant village, hearing of the approach of the high court of reformers and the troops, fled from the place and secreted themselves. The soldiers, however, on their arrival, seized upon a schoolmaster, asked him where the lord of that place and the minister were concealed, and where they had hidden their treasures. The schoolmaster replied that he could not answer either of the questions. They then stripped him naked, bound him with cords, and beat him most unmercifully with cudgels. This cruelty, not extorting any confession from him, they scorched him in various parts of his body, when, to gain a respite from his torments, he promised to show them where their treasures were hid. The soldiers gave ear to this with pleasure, and the schoolmaster led them to a ditch full of stones, saying, Beneath these stones are the treasures ye seek for. Eager after money, they went to work, and soon removed these stones, but, not finding what they sought after, they beat the schoolmaster to death, buried him in the ditch, and covered him with the very stones he had made them remove. Some of the soldiers ravished the daughters of a worthy Protestant before his face, and then tortured him to death. A minister and his wife they tied back to back and burnt. Another minister they hung upon a cross-beam, and making a fire under him, broiled him to death. A gentleman they hacked into small pieces, and they filled a young man's mouth with gunpowder, and setting fire to it, blew his head to pieces. As their principal rage was directed against the clergy, they took a pious Protestant minister, and, tormenting him daily for a month together, in the following manner, making their cruelty regular, systematic, and progressive. They placed him amidst them, and made him the subject of their derision and mockery, during a whole day's entertainment, trying to exhaust his patience, but in vain, for he bore the whole with true Christian fortitude. They spit in his face, pulled his nose, and pinched him in most parts of his body. He was hunted like a wild beast, until ready to expire with fatigue. They made him run the gauntlet between two ranks of them, each striking him with a twig. He was beat with their fists, he was beat with ropes, they scourged him with wires, he was beat with cudgels, they tied him up by the heels with his head downwards until the blood started out of his nose, mouth, etc., they hung him by the right arm until it was dislocated, and then had it set again. The same was repeated with his left arm. Burning papers dipped in oil were placed between his fingers and toes. His flesh was torn with red-hot pincers. He was put to the rack. They pulled off the nails of his right hand. The same repeated with his left hand. He was bastinadoed on his feet. A slit was made in his right ear. The same repeated on his left ear. His nose was slit. They whipped him through the town upon an ass. They made several incisions in his flesh. They pulled off the toenails of his right foot. The same they repeated with his left foot. He was tied up by the loins and suspended for a considerable time. The teeth of his upper jaw were pulled out. The same was repeated with his lower jaw. Boiling lead was poured upon his fingers. The same was repeated with his toes. A knotted cord was twisted about his forehead in such a manner as to force out his eyes. During the whole of these horrid cruelties, particular care was taken that his wounds should not mortify, and not to injure him mortally until the last day, when the forcing out of his eyes proved his death. End of chapter 8, part 2